In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. There are three readings, as always, this morning. One is not like the other. The first one is the nitty-gritty of early Christianity. Paul and Silas are out evangelizing the town. The town decides it's not in their best interest to hear this new gospel. They strip them of their clothes. They beat them. They throw them in jail. They lock them into stocks. But at midnight, there's an earthquake and they are freed and the jailer assumes he will have to commit suicide because all of his prisoners have escaped. But they haven't. And Paul says, we're here. And the jailer falls down, hears the gospel, is baptized, and his whole household is baptized. That's the excitement of early Christianity and maybe of Christianity today as well. Then the next two readings are a different world. Uh, in the book of Revelation, John is having a vision. I'm coming soon. I'm the Alpha and the Omega. The Spirit and the Bride say, come. All who hear say, come. And then in Jesus' famous high priestly prayer, John 17, he prays that they all may be one. I was a very young man at this time when the ecumenical movement was born and the World Council of Churches was founded and Lutherans and Catholics decided to risk talking to one another. And the impetus for all this was Jesus' prayer that they may be one. And Catholics even decided that there could be other true Christians besides those who acknowledged the Bishop of Rome. It was an amazing time and everybody was excited with the possibility that the whole world would look at Christians and would see in them Christ. Christ one with the Father and Christ one with them. But the world today may be more like the world that beat up Paul and Silas. Last week, the details of the abuse of children by Baptist ministers running into the hundreds was finally under much pressure published and that reminded everybody of how frequently the Roman Catholic Church had to publish and go to court and pay millions of dollars in fines to adjudicate the deeds of child abuse that they had done. Nevertheless, Against such oneness, which Revelation and John proclaim, consider these recent statements, especially in this church where you have such an extraordinary social ministry and where I'll again in the next two Sundays be teaching two final classes on Matthew 25 in as much as you have done it to the least of these you have done it to me, a very famous evangelical conservative named John MacArthur, who has a huge following of tens of thousands of other clergy, released this statement. He's not only not for the social gospel, he's against it. We deny that political or social activism should be viewed as integral components of the gospel or primary to the mission of the church. Though believers can and should utilize all lawful means that God has providentially established 
to have some effect on the laws of a society, we deny that these activities are either evidence of faith or constitute a central part of the church's mission given to her by Jesus Christ. We deny that laws or regulations possess any inherent power to change sinful hearts. And by the way, we deny that whites should ever be made to feel guilty for the historic oppression of blacks in this country. If that weren't enough, a statement that came out on the Christian blogs last week announced the AR-15 rifle is the official rifle of conservative evangelicals, nationalist Christians in this country. It is the rifle of the Christian right. Members of the Christian right tend to believe that the United States shares a special relationship with God and that current political and cultural trends threaten this relationship. They increasingly agree that a violent upheaval will be necessary to reset this relationship and that God will sanction this, vi this violence in order to return to the day when Christianity was the official religion of this government. These would seem to be problems similar or worse than those of the early church when Paul is thrown in jail. And then consider this, the whole idea of Johannine mysticism in which Jesus and the Father are one since the foundation of the world and Jesus and the church are one and the church and all people are one. Someone wrote in a blog this past week, Americans have lost the ability to say we. They cannot find we. They can only find individuals, you and me, and maybe you and me against each other. And so people who refuse to wear masks refuse because there are only individuals and not one corporate entity. People who refuse vaccinations because there are only individuals and not a whole community. There is no widely acknowledged common good, no commonwealth as some states declare themselves to be. The question is whether there is an answer to this fracturing of the country and of the American church. So Jesus says again, John 17, I want all to see my glory given since creation and now everlasting. I will be in Christians. It's a mystical sign. <laughs> As the Father is in me. Now what if a common mystical unity existed among all Christians and even among all peoples? How would we prepare for such? How would we seek it? How could we walk in the direction that the universe, according to the book of Revelation, is walking? How does a Christ mysticism grow? Could we just meditate every Sunday on Jesus' high priestly prayer? There's mystical, mysterious, overwhelming oneness. Is this even an option for Lutherans? Perhaps we could all visit European cathedrals or cathedrals in Seattle or religious art in museums? Could you feel a unification in which we all come together as one 
through Bible study, devotions, walking the labyrinth, backpacks and quilts and other forms of social ministry. Don't look at me, I'm not the answer. When Carolyn married me, she had grown up in an evangelical family. Her mother thought it odd when she would visit our house and I said made up and I recited prayers that I knew by heart. She wondered if this suggested a lack of true faith in me because evangelicals made up their own prayers on the spot. And Carolyn even wondered, you're so smart. You're so rational. You're so doctrinal. It's like the whole tradition lives in your head. <laughs> but does it live around you and outside of you? Are Lutherans that different from evangelicals? But once I had a vision, new to most Lutherans, Carolyn's class in the Anthropology of Religion at Chico State was she was uh, making a film on Holy Communion that she could show to the class because this was a class with the title Magic, Witchcraft, and Religion. That was so students would take the class. <clears throat> she thought that uh, maybe you could give these students in her class, hundreds of them, uh, some real unexpected sense of what goes on in Christianity. And I realized, as many of us sometimes do, that you think you know what communion is about until you try to say so. And then when you try to say so, words fail you. But one Sunday in this very church, the arrangements were a little different, but I was sitting on the aisle as I always do, and a mother and her children came up, they were coming up the aisle here, and the little boy brushed against me. And I felt like I was having a mystical experience that Christ, whom we say is present in the bread and the wine, was present in this little boy. And I was present in him and I touched him back. And from then on, I tried to find excuses for touching people not everybody thinks that's cool, but especially if the retired clergy were coming forth, because I meet with them twice a month for lunch, so they all know me, uh, I would always reach out, and some of them were slightly tottering. Two or three of them have died since then. I would always reach out and touch them. And I thought, well, at least with these guys, I have a oneness. And couldn't we maybe have this oneness all of us, every single Sunday, instead of just the doctrine, yes, we believe that uh, the bread turns into Jesus, yes, the wine turns into Jesus' blood. But in addition to that, that always sounds a little rational, what if we really had this sense that Christ is present right here among us, and we were feeling it? But then I remembered, in seminary, I read this comment. Anyone who seeks to be a mystic and remains a Protestant is just a dilettante. <laughs> Meaning, the only good mystics are Catholics. That always bothered me. I wasn't a mystic by heart, as Carolyn had seen, but I thought maybe I could work on it. So Living Lutheran, the ELCA magazine that arrived this past week, had this story in it. An ELCA pastor, just like me, entered a two-year spiritual direction certificate program. He began following prompts from the spiritual exercises, which Ignatius Loyola, the founder of the Jesuits, had written hundreds of years ago during the Reformation. Choose, here were his instructions. Choose to become aware of the gaze of God as he is with you and loving you. 
And the pastor said, at first this seemed foreign for a Lutheran, but now this focus, along with the recommended slow, deep breathing, rouses my heart. And I'm starting to feel like I could be one with Christ, just like Jesus said in the Gospel of John. Could we Lutherans prepare to have experiences like this? It's not a trick. Uh, it's the embrace of mystical practices and prayers and devotions and so-called Lectio Divina in which you take a Bible reading and you read it very slowly and then you read it again and you try to absorb it into your self. So what steps could Lutherans take or all Christians take to experience this? So then I thought, well, maybe it's the architecture. Because there was another article in Living Lutheran this past week that talked about a church that had burned down, nothing left in a fire. And for months, the congregation met, totally traumatized. What could we do different? What could be new? Then they had a congregational meeting and they decided, let's build it again exactly in the same way. And the article quotes a line from Isaiah, behold, I'm doing things new, but they weren't up for it. Some of you, maybe all of you, have heard of Robert Schuller's Crystal Cathedral in Garden Grove, California, east of LA. It served for many years as the backdrop of the so-called Hour of Power, which was once the most popular religious television program in the nation. The show's star, Robert Schuller, started this as a drive-in theater and it grew to 2,500 people every Sunday in a specially commissioned church by a famous architect. And he called it the shopping center for God. At the end of his life, his ministry went bankrupt amidst charges of graft and congregational turmoil. And then something amazing happened. I wrote about it in a Christian blog. If you have a famous cathedral that held 2,500 people and was the most well-known among evangelical Pentecostals, and now the Roman Catholic diocese of that city bought it and decided to turn it into a Catholic cathedral. So I wrote this article we need scholars to watch what happens. What do you actually do to turn a Pentecostal church into a Catholic cathedral? What will change? Occasionally, when I was down in San Diego visiting my daughter, we would go by, but it was never quite done yet. They were spending millions. And then last month, a uh, world famous, uh, glass art woman who happens to have her shop in Chico wrote me. She has commissions from all over the world for stained glass windows in churches. She wrote me and said, remember that article you wrote? What does it take to turn an a Pentecostal church into a Catholic cathedral? Well, here's one thing. And she sent me a picture of these magisterial, enormous missions with a kind of mystical Christ walking among his people. And she said, I did that. But could it be, could that be it? If this church accidentally burned down, God forbid, but it was in the living Lutheran, what would we do if we said, God says, I'm doing something new. I'd like to do something new. What would we do? Would we turn it into a soup kitchen maybe? Because of our tremendous emphasis 
on Matthew 25 and social ministry? Would we put up 14 stations of the cross and every Lent we would stop at each one and say a prayer and meditate? Would we put up a cross with Christ on it, the way all Catholic churches do? And would this enlist us in more mystical experiences? Would we avoid razzmatazz? Who knows what we would do? Who knows? But it's an interesting idea well short of the church burning down, that Lutherans could try to think of ways that Jesus' mystical prayer, it's not one that Luther quoted a lot. Luther was too busy quoting Paul. But this mystical prayer in John 17, that they all may be one, that we are one with each other, that we're all moving towards the ultimate consummation of the universe, ordained since the beginning. Could that be it? Who knows? One thing we could do, we could recite John 17, this was a suggestion I read this week, as if it were the Lord's Prayer. In fact, some scholars think that John 17 is the fourth gospel's equivalent of the Lord's Prayer, which is in Matthew and Luke. And so every Sunday, we would pray John 17, that we could experience the oneness of Christ in ourselves. How about Memorial Day today? My daughter-in-law in Chico works at a bank and every day on her lunch hour, she walks across the street to a cemetery and meditates. I'm the only one who understands her because I wrote a book on death and dying. So whenever she's visiting, she always tells me more about it because her friends find this freakish. But she walks in the cemetery, she reads the tombstones, and I guess she wouldn't have this language, I guess she thinks she's seeking a mystical experience. And maybe some of us will watch concerts today in honor of Memorial Day, or maybe some of us, have, my brother was a chaplain killed in Vietnam, maybe some of us have um, deceased veterans in our family histories, and we will think of them. So there are opportunities everywhere. I was gonna close there, and then I happened to come across a hymn, a new hymn. Uh, there's a woman named Carolyn Winfrey Gillette, who is a Presbyterian minister, and she has written 500 hymns in the last 10 or 20 years. And she tries, following Isaiah, she tries to write hymns that talk about things that nobody's talking about. She writes hymns about women whom nobody listens to. She writes hymns about all kinds of things that we wish happened but don't happen. So Sherry's going to play um, a famous hymn, well, not so famous, that's why she's going to play it, because you may not know this hymn, called Jesus, Savior, Pilot Me. This is what it sounds like. Here are the new words she wrote. 
God, our nation, feels the loss as our children pay the cost. For the violence we accept, for the silence we have kept, Rachel weeps for children gone. God of love, this can't go on. Jesus, Lord, we hear you say, don't turn little ones away. May we build a kinder land where our children understand every child here matters more than the guns we clamor for. Holy Spirit, wind and flame, send us out in Jesus' name. May we shout and say, enough. May we build a world of love till the sounds of weapons cease, till our young can grow in peace. We could sing new hymns like that every Sunday. Amen. <laughs>